All right, hello, I'm Steve Polsky, the founder and CEO of Juvo, and thank you for having me here today. Um, Juvo is a Latin word, it means to help or assist, and it's kind of core to kind of the, the thesis of the company. And I found the last session uh, particularly inspiring. Um, and so we dream big, but now we're going to dream big times 10 on everything that we're doing. But uh, uh, the thesis of Juvo is that there's an opportunity right now to enable a new wave of consumers to gain access to financial services and participate in the, Juvo, in the digital economy. That we can really enable hundreds of millions, if not a billion people, to build a financial identity. It's technically possible today um, in a way that creates an enormous opportunity around the world for these people to participate. Um, to give you a sense of the company, we're in San Francisco, offices in Sao Paulo, offices in Miami, offices in Singapore. Um, and, and growing very quickly. We've built 100 million consumer profiles so far, and by the end of the year, we'll cross a, a quarter of a billion. So we're also just starting on our, on our pathway, um, but have big goals in what we want to do. And Brazil is important to us. We're, we're in Brazil, we're growing in Brazil, we're committed to the market. Uh, we partner with mobile operators today that reach half of the Brazilian population. And, uh, and so that's in particular why I'm interested in, in this group and this conference. Excellent. Um, perhaps a Chris? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so my name is Chris Tsakalakis. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, may, or maybe she did. Um, <laughs> I'm the CEO of uh, Vivino. Uh, Vivino is the world's largest wine app and uh, marketplace. Uh, I joined Vivino about a year and a half ago. I've spent the last 23 years working in e-commerce. Uh, before Vivino, I ran a company called StubHub for eight years. Um, and I joined Vivino a year and a half ago because of the huge opportunity we have as a business. Uh, the company started in 2010 in Copenhagen, and we have users uh, all around the world. Uh, Brazil, as a matter of fact, is our number two country in terms of downloads. We have 38 million people who've downloaded the Vivino app, um, and we collect information on wines. So we have 11 million wines in our database, and on those wines we have 135 million ratings out of five stars. So we use that information to give potential buyers of a wine independent information on what wine they should buy and which wine would be best for them. And we couple that information with the information we have on you, what wines you scan, what wines you like, to uh, present a, kind of a, a personalized list of wines for you to buy. Uh, so that's the basic idea behind, uh, behind Vivino. And uh, as part of our international expansion, we're really excited to be launching in Brazil later this year. Uh, we already operate in 15 countries. Uh, mostly in Western Europe, uh, US and Canada, uh, but w more recently in Hong Kong, Australia and Singapore. And I'm um, very happy to be talking about uh, how Brazil plays into our, our grand plans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, or is it afternoon? I think it's still morning. Uh, my name is Akechi Wonka. I am the CEO of uh, Minds. Um, similar to Juvo, we are tackling a global problem of access to credit. There are about um, 2 billion people in the world who don't have access to credit but have mobile phones. Uh, there's another 1 billion people who don't also have access to credit but don't have mobile phones, so they're not really reachable. But it presents an entirely new possible um, way of actually granting people access to credit, which is a fundamental, we think, um, social equality issue around the world and one of the things that really separates uh, more developed countries from uh, the developing countries. So we um, are based in San Francisco. We first launched in Nigeria, which is a company same size as Brazil, um, sort of a baptism of fire. It's a pretty difficult country to do business in, um, but we're now expanding um, to Brazil. Um, so what we really do is we work with large local enterprises to enable the local ecosystem to reach customers of class C, D, E. Um, we essentially build an alternative bureau by gathering data from many, many different sources, from banks, merchants, telcos, etc. And on top of that, we layer a Klarna-like or a firm or Visa-like service to enable them to get cash loans or make uh, purchases in a way that you know uh, a wealthier or a uh, person in a more advanced country uh, would. So that's essentially what we do. I'm very, very excited.
excited to very excited to launch uh, launch in Brazil. All right. Um, why don't we go to the the bad sign right 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 now? A little bit, but at least. But um, as a law firm, we see many companies coming, and and we feel the pain that it is to get into the Brazilian market, how to get there, how to operate there. What what have you faced so far? Is it something that you have found um, uh, uh, amazingly difficult in comparison to other jurisdictions you've operated? You think there is, you know, some obstacles, but you're going to get there. I mean, for me, it's a bit, you know, we started in Nigeria, so Brazil is actually not that bad. <laughs> I mean, that's the honest truth. I mean, um, uh, I don't know, the, you know, the way that I personally, I believe in sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, and what I mean by that is I personally, I'm, I moved to Sao Paulo, I'm, you know, I moved to Nigeria four years ago to build a business, I'm moving to Sao Paulo, and I just, you know, in the beginning, I do everything myself, I go and do the relationships myself, I understand the culture myself, I settle in. And, uh, you know, that's sort of, I just really kind of immerse in these, uh, in these big markets. That's how we, we tend to do it. So the, the difficulties that we face in Brazil um, so far, um, you know, just sort of, you know, understanding how people think, the cultural issues, regulatory issues, tax issues, normal, normal types of sort of country, country issues that you would deal with in expansion. So you'd say that having the right people on the ground with resilience is one of the key things? Yeah, I would I would uh, look at this positively that uh, the Brazilian market is uh, absolutely a wonderful market for lawyers and tax specialists, um, and it's an enormous pain in the ass for us. Um, we we spent the better part of the year working with your firm to understand how we can structure um, legally structure our operations there, and we operate already in 15 different countries. Um, and, we, and this has by far been the most difficult. Um, and again, legal and tax issues. So typically what we do is, we, as I said, we have users around the world. Um, we go to markets where we, where we already have users and then we find a local partner or set of partners who can supply wine to our users. And then we will send emails and other notifications to our users to get them to buy and then the partner fulfills the wine. So pretty, pretty basic and simple model but in Brazil, finding a partners was great. We've talked to many. Uh, we're starting with one or two. They're, they're fantastic. Um, the attitude of the people we work with are great. But the, the, all the infrastructure that we need uh, on the legal side, and then even uh, simple things like payments. We use Stripe to do payments. Um, in the 15 markets we're in, Stripe is like in beta in Brazil, so it's not, it, it'll sort of work initially, but there are other things that we, we will need to build there. So it's, it's a special market, it's worth it for us, uh, but like I said, it's, uh, I, I think it's a godsend to, uh, to lawyers and tax specialists, so that's good. I don't have a whole lot to add. I would, I would just say, like, so far, so good for us. I mean, we're, we're a unique company in San Francisco because we don't do any business in the United States. We're, we're in 26 different countries in Latin America and Southeast Asia. So we kind of knew going into it that we were going to build a company that would face uh, different complexities around the world. Um, you know, like, Brazil's a big market, so we're, we're there, uh, we're committed to it, and, uh, and we have lawyers and tax specialists, too. <laughs> so we're getting going. Okay, and, and what have been the bright spots so far? Um, for us, it is... No, no, I, I, sorry, I just know where to start. For us, it's, uh, it's just a gigantic opportunity for us. I think we, we've already signed partnerships that reach half of the country. So Brazil is a kind of our marquee market where we're putting together the full vision of what Juvo set out to do from the very beginning, which is meeting people with really tiny interactions around their prepaid mobile phone and reaching a broad, broad base of the population, but taking uh, consumers up a pathway to checking and savings accounts, to digital payment means, to to digital commerce, and uh, and all of that is uh, is coming together in Brazil. So it's incredibly exciting for us. And you see some space with uh, for collaboration here, at least. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, we came at it from different uh, geographies, actually. And it's pretty exciting that we're uh, now in the same market. So I actually, we don't um, offer the same services currently. So I think there is actually room for collaboration. So absolutely. It, it's interesting because uh, we're talking about very different markets here, here and, and, and here especially. 
Um, can you talk a little bit more about the market that you see in Brazil, if there are certain segments or places, regions, how does it, um, how does it attract you? Yeah, for us, Brazil is hugely attractive. Um, most of the growth of Vivino has been organic. We add about 660,000 new users every month and uh, with almost no marketing. And it's been, as I said, around the world. Brazil is our number two market in terms of downloads. Uh, we have three million people who've downloaded the, the Vivino app in Brazil, and it's our number three market in terms of active users. Um, when we do research, uh, we've, we've done it actively in Brazil for the last few years, and our brand recognition is higher in Brazil than it is in the United States or uh, even in Denmark, which is where we started, which is kind of nuts. Um, and even a recognition as a, an app to buy wine, and you, you can't really buy wine in the app, uh, in the Vivino app in Brazil. So it, for us, it's, it's a great market. It's, uh, what, what some people have told me is that once Brazilians like a particular app, they really, they, they grab onto it, like and they're, they're really great users of uh, social media and, and lots, of, lots of other apps. And for, for whatever reason, we, we seem to be well-liked. Um, in Brazil, maybe that'll change after t today, but, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so w w when we look at markets, because the country is so big, what we're doing is shipping wine. And so when we're gonna start, we're only gonna start in, in uh, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, uh, but the idea is that we will expand beyond that. Um, typically the types of wines that are interesting to our users tend to be imported, a little more expensive than the average you'd get in a grocery store. So the more affluent areas are the, are gonna, are the ones that are more interesting to us. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the highlight of my experience and the company's experience in Brazil so far is the people. Um, I think uh, I've been surprised at how welcoming um, they've been to partnerships. Um, and we're really there to enable the ecosystem and work with a bunch of the local partners to offer uh, this service to class C, D, and E type of customers. And, um, you know, things definitely take a long time with many coffees and lunches and family visits <laughs> to get deals done. But, uh, but uh, that's fine. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think the, just the people have been fantastic, you yeah. know. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. What do you find about the talent pool there? Have you... Uh, uh, have you managed, managed to, to, to source your needs locally in a, in a positive way? We're hiring, actually, so we're growing quickly, and it's a fascinating data challenge in particular. So uh, we've been... We're... Actually, I've been... A, more broadly, at the company trying to advocating around the for Juva that we stop thinking of ourselves as a company that's based in San Francisco and we have these different hubs around the world, and more think of ourselves as uh, this uh, a company with three primary offices in Brazil, San Francisco, and Singapore, and we just happen to have an office in, in San Francisco. So we're we're hiring kind of full stack in San Francisco, and we want to build it as a, almost a standalone entity where we can do. Uh, everything locally, because I think that's the way to really tailor what we're doing to the market, to really be part of the Brazilian economy, and uh, and be fully immersed. Yeah, and so far, you, you haven't faced uh, major regulatory issues uh, going locally, or anything that would... So far, so good. Yeah. Great, excellent. Yeah, I'd like to invite the, the audience to pose questions as well, as, as and make this as a conversation, if there's anything that anybody would like to ask. We have uh, one question over there. Well, we, we have, I think, I think we're streaming, so we need the microphone. Okay. Other than, uh, like he said, uh, taxes and regulations and all the other burdens, uh, what are the, big cha the bigger challenges you are facing in your expansion to Brazil in terms of business? Um, I think for us, it's just understanding the business culture and getting accepted by the business community. Um, understanding you know, what means no, what means maybe, what means yes, how to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, everything's gonna be fine, yes, yeah, great, great, great. You know, so Brazilians apparently don't like to say no. Um, and so just figuring out how to actually get 
things signed and, and moving along and what it really takes to build trust uh, with uh, your local business partners. Like I said, many coffees, many family visits, many, you know. Um, so that's kind of one of the big challenges. And then I think on the regulatory side, you know, it's a great time, I think, to, to get to, you know, to, to, at least in our space, um, to be in Brazil because there's lots of regulatory, um, I would say, support to diversify the financial sector away from sort of the four, the you know, top four banks or whatever. Um, so it's kind of a good moment, you know, but there's so many licenses for just about every aspect of financial services. And so just making sure you have the right licenses and then also, you know, building the relationship with the central bank so that they are aware of what you're doing, are comfortable with what you're doing, and also are accepting of you in the country, I think is uh, the biggest thing for us. Uh, sorry, I think for uh, Vivino that one of the bigger challenges as an e-commerce company is, is the payment systems, because they're just different. I think Brazil has, you know, wonderfully well-established payment systems. They're just different than the, mar the other 15 markets that we're in. So uh, building out a capability for, for Boletos and for uh, other types of payment mechanisms beyond just the basic credit card, uh, which is what we, we've been able to get away with, let's put it that way, in the other uh, countries we're in, that's, that's been a big challenge and still one that we're, we haven't fully tackled, but, but will uh, as we grow that, uh, our, our presence in Brazil. So perhaps it, there's there's some room for synergy here, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. For, for us, we just want to move faster, right? There's always a, a desire to move faster, but things take kind of a, somewhat of a methodical pace. Um, I do think some of the tax regulations around us affect consumer offerings um, in a way that I don't think, uh, well, that... that that aren't, aren't uh, positive for consumers. I think we could accomplish more if there were some tax changes, but, uh, but that's out of our control. I think we got another question over there. Yeah, here. Um, so two of you, are, I mean, three, the three of you are coming to the country and two of you are focusing on class C, D, and E, and one of you is close, focusing on class like A and A+. Plus. So there's almost like two different types of countries of two different Brazils that you guys are dealing with. Uh, I was wondering what the difference is on how you at as Vivino see Brazil in terms of like selling to these very affluent and high income people versus you two that are trying to sell a product to uh, really low income and, and medium income people. Well, I think you summed it up. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, we we have a very different services, and uh, in general, it's not just in Brazil that you know we, we we're targeting folks who are a little more affluent. In general, Vivino tries to target people who are interested in wine. If you're not interested in wine, there's no reason to use Vivino, or if you drink the same wine every time. Um, so it's it's really this idea of discovery and and trying to find the best value. Um, so for us, some of the issues around, but, but even the issues around payments. Let's say like paying in installments. Um, that's not typical in the other markets we're in uh, because if you're more affluent, you don't need to pay in installments. So it, it, it definitely is something that we need in Brazil based on what our partners have told us because our partners already sell wine in Brazil. So I, I think it's... Uh, my guess is that the audience that we're able to attract from a uh, amount of money made standpoint will be broader than the, than the audience, the types of audiences we attract uh, outside of Brazil. I think our goal is to create the next 100 million uh, potential Vivino users right, to enable people to move up. Um, yeah, very different markets. Uh, when we launch in Brazil, uh, it's about scale. Like We will almost instantly launch uh, across the entire country, right? And we typically see um, signing up 1% to 2% of the prepaid consumer base per month. So really get to pretty quick growth pretty quickly. And, and other countries... Uh, We'll, t we'll touch 50% or sometimes more of all the, all the prepaid consumers in a country. It ends up being over 20-some percent of the entire country. And so the hopes are that um, we can enable some, you know, have an individual impact, but also do things at scale to have a kind of macro impact. That's fantastic. Uh, one, two questions. Three questions. Hi, Luke Finney. Um, as a founder of a company that's looking to follow in your footsteps and set up an office in Brazil, um, just two quick questions. One, uh, how have you tackled hiring technical talent? And 
um, some of the challenges that were spoken about earlier in the panels. And then the second question would be, as you're setting up your offices, how do you think about the macro political risk, potentially, or, or just the, the political um, uncertainty? In terms of uh, talent, um, so I would just say, again, maybe a situation, I grew up in Nigeria, to, and so maybe have a different perspective on, on this. Um, and I would say, in my experience in Brazil, everything that I say people complain about Brazil not being whatever, fast, or you know, just in Nigeria, it's way worse, I can, I can tell you. Um, so for us, we don't hire many technical folks in the remote markets. All of our product and engineering is here in Silicon Valley, just because there's more high quality people here, it's easier, it's harder to compete for this talent, but the pool of talent is higher. Um, we, uh, ha finding quality uh, talent in Brazil is, uh, just like Nigeria, is a challenge. And particularly for engineers, a lot of times when engineers get to a certain level of expertise in their careers, they get picked up by European or, or, or you know, uh, US uh, companies. So for example, in Nigeria, the top developers, none of them stay in Nigeria. They just all leave and they go work for Microsoft or whatever. Um, I'm seeing something a little bit similar in Brazil. So hiring is definitely a challenge. So we've had to really concentrate all of our hardcore um, technical talent in the valley, which is really why I'm on a plane every three or four days. Um, and then in Brazil, we are um, trying to hire um, younger engineers who are there are more of, and try and have them mentored by the folks uh, in the valley, um, so that we actually build up you know local uh, capacity. But they're not going to be making like high-level architectural or really big systems decisions. They're going to be doing integrations into local payments over the boleto, SPB, or whatever, and those kinds of things. Um, so I think it's, uh, and particularly on the AI side, it's almost impossible to find high quality. Uh, machine learning engineers, uh, you know, really outside of a few concentrated places in the world, the Valley being one of them. So talent is definitely an issue. And I think building these these companies, you have to think very carefully about um, how you hire for talent and how you create a culture so that the Brazilian folks or the Nigerian folks don't feel like they're some sort of stepchild to the, the U.S. Uh, office, which happens a lot. So we've really tried to structure the company very carefully to kind of manage for these sorts of things. Uh, my name is Estenio Franco, and the question goes of all the respect for the other two folks have been in Nigeria. Congratulations. Brazil will be pretty okay for you, with all the respect. But uh, we just came from a major crisis. We had like a GDP loss nearly to a country in a civil war, minus 4%, and we have been in political crisis for the last four or five years. And now in the press, in the media, there is a lot of international media about the new government. Uh, what's your view? I would like to say off the records, but they are record, so <laughs> do what you can do. Uh, surely it's about perspectives about the country, not about the market, but how politically you see the country, it's affecting your decision, it affected your decision, or does it matter? From our perspective, we're pretty committed to, we're are committed to global markets. Everything we do is global. We're in you know, El Salvador, Guatemala, the, the all over Latin America. So I think we take a bit of uh, maybe a longer term view. Like uh, Brazil is a big market, and and we're in, and uh, and we understand there'll be ups and downs along the way, but uh, but we're committed to the market, right? That w for what we do, we start with the way um, consumers use their prepaid phone. And one thing about that, it's a, it's a core utility. We're all addicted to our phones. Like I believe like through ups and downs and all different economic cycles, like that will not change across the world. Um, and so that adds a level of stability to our product offering, um, you know, throughout all of this. I think that uh, as th has been said before here in this, uh, in this conference that this sector has not experienced the same impact of downturns in the economy as other sectors in the country. It has experienced quite a growth, despite everything else, politically or otherwise. But I think uh, we have a, another question there, and then a question here. Sorry, I wasn't going to say, it. it's sort of a question, but another comment. Um, I've had a, an office in Brazil for six years. I have a consulting firm for, in investor relations advisory. And I would just add that not only are the tax and lawyers uh, making a killing, but if there's an accounting firm that has strong English speakers that 
it, that would be very helpful. We've been through four accounting firms locally in Brazil, and that impacts your ability to run your operations day to day, to try to close your books. Today, we're only able to close our books by the 15th or 16th of the month, and we don't have a significantly complicated business. So there's, beyond the setup, there's the ability to really continue to run the business. Um, so that was one, and the other was, the difference, and in, in it's very difficult to hire when you're scaling up part-time, this concept of part-timers, part-timers that then move to full-time because of the labor practices in Brazil. So, sorry, not a question, but I just wanted to offer that out for folks that are looking at uh, building their operations in the country as well. I think we had some of that and, and in Brazil and other places where we started out like dipping our toe in the water uh, and we kind of came to the conclusion that was not really effective. You know, like people shuttling back and forth, people part-time, people half in the market and we've come to realize that like the, it's having people who are from Brazil, who are close to our, our key customers who are and building um, a real presence has really had an impact in Brazil and other places. And perhaps there are opportunities for technology companies to fill the gaps there and increase productivity, uh, offering better services, like, like right, Yvonne here. Um, we have another question there, and Ben here. Um, one of the, the situations that are really particularly particular from Brazil is the, are the labor laws. They are very different from anything else in the world particularly from here, from the Silicon Valley. What do you think uh, that it will be, what do you think you can uh, retain, uh, use in the, the lay, in the labor situation, in the labor, in the labor relations here in the, uh, in the US, here in the Silicon Valley, that you can still use in Brazil despite this uh, labor law that is very restrictive, restrictive and what do you think will be your greatest challenges in, inside the, that uh, part, in, in the, on the, the, the laws uh, the, about labor? Um, I, I guess I'll briefly answer that. I think um, that's not how, at least in our company, that's not how we think. And maybe it's because I grew up in an emerging market. So I see a lot of uh, traditionally um, American companies like us who, uh, at least in my own case, would come to Nigeria and, and have a one-size-fits-all solution that they just built in Silicon Valley and had deployed somewhere and then want to bring it to an emerging market. I just don't think it works. Um, and so for us, I think you really have to build from the ground up. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, there's a country of 200 million people that are living every day with these labor laws. So. I don't care, I just work with the labor laws, I just work with the regulation, that's what the country is. And the, I don't think bringing a Silicon Valley mindset into Brazil is the right approach, I just don't think it's gonna work. In labor, in technology, and whatever, I just don't think it works. We have another question there, and then, and then here. Hi, uh, my name is Paulo Zotolo. Uh, I admire your courage in investing in Brazil. I think it's, I mean, if you really want to be global, Brazil is an important country to be. I just would like to know how close are you following all the changes that are happening in Brazil, mainly in terms of tax reforms. There's a new discussion now on tax reforms, and just yesterday, for instance, I read, there's a lot of crazy ideas going on, but just yesterday I read that they are discussing a new tax for e-commerce. Are you guys following this closely? To be honest, we don't follow the, well, I don't follow the daily ups and downs on this. We have, like, kind of advisors in Brazil who are working on that. Um, so. Our many lawyers are following the tax reforms. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, I think at what, whatever market you go into, I mean, our view was like, this is how it is. This is, this is the law as it is today, and we are going to adhere to it. We're going to figure out the best way to set up our business based on the current set of laws. Um, when I worked at uh, eBay, we had government relations people. We could go and lobby and so forth. Vivino has like 120 employees. We're not, we're not going to do any lobbying in in uh, Brasilia to uh, to get the tax reform that we want. So we, we don't have that kind of power or that kind of money. So it's, certainly it's something we'll track, and we have advisors that will help us figure it out. Um, and we're hopeful about it. Um, 
but but we can't make any bets necessarily on it. I was just going to say pension reform it seems to be a much bigger deal than tax reform. I don't know. It seems like just... Yeah, one thing at a time, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So let's get done with pension reform first. I think we got another question here. Hi, my name is Michelle Levy. Uh, I had a question regarding your entry into Brazil. Uh, how do you see the competitive landscape for each one of your businesses? Because if you made the decision to go to Brazil, it's because you found either a white space or you have better efficiencies or things. What if you run into three Fabricios down in Brazil? Um, uh, I, I mean, you know, we're in a very big space. So, you know, if you think, there's really like four different Brazils, right? There's the affluent Brazil, let's say, in a particular region of the country, there's less affluent, you know, and, and I think for us, we serve a particular, we intend to serve a particular Brazil, which is a very different country from maybe that people live in more affluent areas. Um, Competition-wise, uh, there's room, you know, because there's so much um, uh, lack of access to credit in the CDE space, there's room for many, many companies, many Brazilian companies, foreign companies. So um, we don't really care about competition. We'll, you know, we just try and provide services to people, and I think we've got a great opportunity, as do many players in our space. You know. Yeah, for us in the in the wine space, we have this um, dynamic where Vivino is a marketplace, so we match sellers to buyers. And to some extent, some of our sellers, they already sell wine online, so they can be considered competitors. Um, so we, we have those in the U.S. And, and, and other places. Sometimes it's a local merchant, sometimes it's, it's a kind of large online wine platform, so that's who we're starting with as, uh, as our first couple of partners. Uh, but what we have is a unique audience that is interested in us, and for whatever reason, they, they like using Vivino. And, and so our competitive advantage is that we already have people who are actively using the app and, and use it as a utility every time they uh, have a bottle of wine or think about buying a bottle of wine. So our advantage is that we have the audience, and we also have the, the data on both the audience and the wines to create personalization that no other supplier of wine uh, has. And so we can deliver orders to our partners who some might consider to be competitors, but we can do it in a much more efficient way than they can via uh, paid search or other types of advertising. Uh, so that's how we think about it. I think we have, uh, we have time for just one more question. Uh, yes, I was wondering if corruption is a uh, cost of business. We've heard of some big scandals in Brazil, and uh, is that something you have to live with? We launched, we launched first in Nigeria. <laughs> okay, well, um, <laughs> but anyway, this has been a very rich experience. Thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts, your experience, and, and telling us about your company. Um, I think we have to stop for lunch. 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 Okay, where is lunch? Right outside. Okay, you go right outside as soon as we finish this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the audience.